this is a sort of a soft launch of this semester's Be Better Club. Um, Shinor, you know the, the routine, but I'll just mention to Hajer and Haley, the plan is we're gonna walk through the schedule every two weeks, and I've shared this, and so you've all seen it, but the general idea is that um, every Monday we'll spend an hour talking about a contemporary ethic issue. And I've kind of mapped these out in a preliminary way so that each one is coupled to a podcast. So we'll listen to a podcast, and we'll come just to talk generally about what's happening. And you see, we've got a couple of conversations in the beginning to get us warmed up, and then we really step into ethics and big data technologies as we move along through the middle of the semester. Um, we're going to conclude with on, on the 11th of April with a session on, on the bystander effect, which I think is importantly related, but kind of a, a broader issue around ethics. And then think about ethics centers and the role they play in a sort of special session on April 25th towards the end of the term. But that's all to say. Let me see if I can stop that. That's all to say um, that the goal for this more this afternoon's conversation is to think with the three of you about what other things we should be thinking about as a community. Um, so the idea is that we're just going to sort of have a, a little um, discussion today about what things are on your mind when you're thinking about ethics. And then we'll take a vote. I'll send out a, a like a poll to everybody after the conversation and um, switch out a topic or add one based on our conversation today. Does that make sense? I'm going to make sure. Yes, it does. Yeah. Ah, thanks, Ajir. <laughs> oh, dear. So exciting. Um, so Shinor says yes. Haley says yes. I think we're on board. Um, the idea here is that uh, there's a lot of things we could talk about and a lot of things happening in the news, uh, some more pop culture, some university related, some big picture technology. And so we could talk about any of those. But what I'd like your help in this afternoon is just listing those out. And again, the way that Be Better has run in the past is that I don't do a lot of um, framing, although I could talk about ethical theories and, and the way they might apply or ethical decision-making techniques. Um, usually we just kind of free for, free for all it and think together about what's happening. So um, this conversation will just keep really short and really informal today since it, it looks like it's just gonna be the four of us. Um, but do you have any ideas or advice about things you'd like to talk about in terms of um, ethics in the contemporary world? Um, I, I just want to say that I like the idea of discussing um, ethics and and uh, from different pers uh, perspectives. For example, I just uh, had a discussion with uh, uh, someone in my country in Saudi Arabia, and he is talking about uh, purchasing AI uh, um, uh, medical equipment from uh, the United States. So he tries to um, to have this discussion with me about uh, what about the AI ethics um, um, policy in uh, the United States and how can we apply this uh, policy in uh, uh, my country? So yeah, that's make me the, just uh, thinking about the universal idea of uh, ethics and how can we apply uh, one uh, uh, one. Uh, policy here in the United States and how can um, um, convince, uh, for example, that person who works in the um, uh, health department in uh, Saudi Arabia uh, to look at the ethical issues uh, um, um, uh, in the same way I looked at that issue. And, do you know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting. Yeah, that's super interesting, Hajir. Yeah. yeah. So I, I hear you saying that, you know, there's, there's this idea that like the US or any country, but the US in this case, could mm -hmm. develop a policy and then another country could just sort of pick that policy up and apply it. Yeah, they especially only... for the yeah, AI, uh, it's a, yeah. a AI technology in hospital. And he tries to take it and uh, just apply it in Saudi Arabia hospital. 
So right, as if yeah. there's no other yeah. Like, yeah. Or, or policy differences across the yeah. two countries. Yeah, yeah. Haley and Shanor, you might have other examples of that I, some things are coming to my mind too. Um, I was thinking about the the differences in um, biobanking technologies, so contribution to genetic biobanks, um, and a lot of um, smaller, tighter, tight, more tightly knit um, European countries. Biobanking contributions are an opt. Uh, some countries have an opt out policy, such that you're contributing unless you say I don't want to, and the U.S. has an opt in policy where you don't contribute unless you choose to, right? If that makes any sense, right? And they had, that's a significant policy difference about how we handle genetic information and how we use it to advance medicine or sell new drugs or whatever. So that's yet another example as you're alongside the AI and hospitals example. Um, and I could imagine there's a whole bunch of these. Uh, I think as you and I have talked about like facial recognition differences and the use of those technologies right. in the US and in other countries as another example of mm. how, just how complicated those differences are. Right. And I, I heard you say as you that part of, the, part of the story there is that it only, that policy transfer only works if the normative framework is universal. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, I'm thinking about by, that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If what we mean by privacy, for instance, is just, is, is universally applicable so that if we figure it out, say in the American context and other folks or want to use the same technology or worry about the same things, they could just pick up our discussion and plop it into a new cultural, historical, geographic context, and it works just the same. Um, and that's a really interesting and ethical conversation. I, you know, I have some strong feelings of my own about the way that values are or are not universal. Um, and I, I don't know, Shinor, if you remember if we've had those conversations in Be Better Club before. I feel like it's come around a couple of times. Yeah, I, I mean, I was thinking, um, I think some of this we just covered this past year also. So I'm just trying to figure out um, the aspects that we have not discussed. And so I'm not able to come up with anything right now. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's a couple of ways to think about um, when I'm asking, when, when I ask about potential topics we could consider. One is to think about the big ethical pictures. And Hege, that's where you directed us, right? Our values universal, and you used this example. The other way to think is um, contextually or, or technologically and say, what, what sort of technologies or situations bring up ethical questions that we might ask? And then, Shin, or the thing we do is sort of circle around the same big picture questions questions of moral standing and values, universality of values, um, that kind of stuff. So you can either come to it through the applied or through the normative, if that makes any sense. Yeah, so like in, I was just thinking about what is in the current news. And there were a couple of things that came up. One was that the medication for COVID, that that is in, um, limited supply and some hospitals are having to um, you know decide who should get it and who should not get it but I think we I think we did that just not too long ago had those kind of discussions um, yeah. collection yeah I think that's right we did have a conversation about uh, well it was more specifically on on the ethics of vaccine rollouts so. yes. Um, yeah, who should get them in first and why? Yeah. Uh, you did talk about okay. shortages of vaccines. And this is, I think you're talking, uh, Shinor, about the antibody treatments, right? So not the vaccines, but the treatments for COVID? Yes. The, the actual pill, I think um, Pfizer has something on the market right now. Yeah. And, and uh, actually, I remember, go ahead. People who actually are suffering from COVID. And, um, but that is in limited supply now. And so, you know, not everybody has access to it. And I'm not sure what their criteria is as to who should get it and who should not get it. But that's always worrisome, you know, when people have to make those kind of decisions. Um, the other thing that is sort of, you know, weighing on my mind is this whole situation about Ukraine and Russia and our place in it, um, you know, so that's something else. And then 
um, North Korea doing their missile testing. And so there is just so much going on. Um, it's really, I mean, it's just, there is no shortage for um, topics, I'm sure. It's just having to frame them. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's well said. I think I was thinking the same thing, and I was thinking much more um, pop culture. I, I I feel like so so there are lots of interesting things we could talk around about Ukraine and Russia and the situation, and U.S. involvement, because some countries have been shipping um, arms basically to the borders to, to Ukraine in support, and the U.S. has not done that as much, and is talking rather about economic sanctions, um, and there's sort of a ramping up of tensions and. The, uh, the Center for Ethics, Ethically Speaking series just did a talk um, on just war theory. Uh, so somebody from some we a faculty member from West Point came and talked to us about basically rules of combat, the ethics around war. Um, when do we go to war and why? And what's the ethical theory that guides and, and all of that? So that would be a really interesting way to circle back around to that conversation. And the same with North Korea missile testing. And in the US, the same response and the same concerns like, there's only so far the U.S. can push in terms of its interventions before it starts stepping on international toes, right? So we've got good collaborations with South Korea, but close enough to China that there's some tensions there, and it's a it's a bit of a, a mess. And Russia is involved in that conversation as well. So yeah, international relations would be a really interesting focus to think about really the ethics of international relations. I like that one. I think, yeah, that sounds really interesting. And I don't think we've done it for either no no we haven't you're right it would be it's a it's a little out of my league in terms of the the political landscape but there's no reason we couldn't invite some some guests or friends in to come support that side of the conversation yeah cool yeah i like that one a lot um i was thinking along the lines of the covid conversation besides the um, justice questions around sh shortages I, i've also been thinking a lot about the misinformation because um I'm sure you've all tracked the this thing that's going on with the Joe Rogan po podcast and and musicians pulling their music from Spotify now. Yep. yep. Yeah. So so that's the other interesting thing that had been on my mind, right? What happens? What's the appropriate response to misinformation? Yeah. Um, and Shanor, we have talked. I think if I, I'll go back and look, but I'm pretty sure we have talked about misinformation before. Um, yes, we have. So we'd have to find a way to frame that, but that is also, that continues to be in the news. So it might be something worth revisiting. Um, more on the, the theory, the normative side, Hajir, I was thinking about the role of thought experiments in ethics. So one of the, one of our, um, one of my students at USF, uh, who's working on dissertation on thought experiments and applied ethics has been thinking about basically what they do and how they do the work they do. So if a thought experiment, are we all comfortable with what thought experiments in ethics are? Mm, not too familiar with it. Okay, so I'll just give you uh, the classic example that should ring some bells, but if you think about the trolley problem, which I think we've talked about before here in these discussions, but the trolley problem is a really famous thought experiment. And basically what a thought experiment is, is a story that sets really tight constraints on a situation to set up an ethical dilemma. So it puts you in a position where you have to choose X or Y. And the choices are usually ethically contentious, so they stimulate conversation. So the traditional trolley problem was developed by uh, Philippa, or Philippa Foote, um, a feminist ethicist in the 1970s who was writing about, she wrote this very famous paper, um, and I think the title is The Abortion Debate and the Doctrine of Double Effect. And in that paper, um, when she was trying to think through the ethics of abortion policies in the 70s, developed the idea of the trolley problem. And the trolley problem is the story where you're in charge of a train or a trolley. Uh, she's British, so that helps. Um, there's, a, there's a trolley or a tram coming down the tracks, and it's going to, there's, for some reason, there's some workers stuck on the track, maybe five of them, right? And if you do nothing, the trolley is going to run over these five workers ahead of you. But you can pull a lever. And if you pull the lever, the trolley then goes off into a different track. And on that track, there's one person stuck. And the idea is, what should you do, right? Um, and she used this story to say there are some instances where um, you can do the thing that you know to be bad, and it's ethically permissible. That is, run over somebody. 
Um, and so she had this whole, uh, this long conversation and in that essay, in that paper. But then the Charlie problem has shown up everywhere in all of these iterations and maybe most recently and most famously in The Good Place, the show with um, the guy from Cheers, <laughs> whose name I can never remember, but the, the, the sitcom The Good Place, uh, where Chidi, the main character, one of the main characters, is forced by the god figure to sort of be in the trolley problem and be in charge of the trolley. Um, and so you can, you can check out the, the YouTube recording of that bit. So that's that's one example of Shinora. That's a thought experiment. Yeah, I think we have discussed that before. I just didn't know it was called the thought experiment. Yeah, and so there are there are tons of these. There, um, we could play this game a very long time, but I, <laughs> I, I we there's there's one called Astrid the Astronaut from Peter Carruthers and Animal Ethics to get at questions of moral standing. There's one about a. Um, uh, uh, Peter Singer, an animal ethicist, has a really famous one about a child drowning. You're walking by the child and do you help or not? And um, all of the thought experiments are kind of like hypothetical situations with really tight constraints so we don't get off and running about options um, to sort of compel us to think about an ethical issue that might we might otherwise skate past. Uh, and there are lots of these. And um, so this student and I are working on a book together on 50 thought experiments in applied ethics. Um, and that's, that's a, so that might be something to think about. Like what's the role of thought experiments in ethics and what role can stories tell? And if it's not academic thought experiments, it's more like, do we, do we recognize any ethical dilemmas that are posed really well by film or TV? Um, and that might be really fun to, to think through and then watch some together. So those were the three that I had in mind so far, um, two plus, plus Shin or yours. And I'm sure there are others we could think through. And I might send out a survey just to, to everybody just to check and see what's, what folks are thinking. But I wanted to check, since you're both still here, um, I didn't hear, I was telling you here, I didn't hear from anybody that said Mondays at 4.30 was a bad time. But uh, it think? works for me. Works for you, okay. Yeah, I like yeah. it. Yeah, I don't yeah. have anything on Monday, so. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'd like to see the numbers get up as we move along through the session. So I will do better advertising for sure, but um, I, I also might ask about changing the time. Shinor, go ahead. I, I, I'm just thinking maybe because this is more of like a brainstorming session. So maybe that's why people were not, um, did not join. Um, they, you know, but I'm sure that when you when we're going to have the content based sessions, that yeah. we'll have a better turnout. Yeah, yeah, my that's my hope too. Um, I knew we were sort of going to gear up slowly, but I anticipated a little bit bigger numbers than than just the three of us, uh, four of us. So, um, so the individuals who have been attending before were they all like mostly students and they have graduated, or do we know? No, uh, so the folks that you saw regularly, Shinor, last semester, yeah. um, a couple were um, graduate students elsewhere. So one was a graduate student, uh, sorry, a postdoc at uh, Purdue University. Another was a graduate PhD student at USF in, in Tampa. Um, we've had two, two staff members and at least one faculty member join us almost every time. And then the rest have been undergraduate students. And I, as far as I know, none of those folks who regularly came last semester have graduated. So it could just be that the time's bad. Yeah. Yeah. yeah my, my, I can be pretty flexible if I have noticed. Okay. I can lock it on my calendar. Yeah. Well, when I send out the reminder uh, after this session or later in the week, I will, um, I'll just ask okay. folks to let me know if the time is bad. Okay. So far, only one student has done that. So I think we're okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> no worries, Haley. Yeah, <laughs> the fun things about this session is that it's it's like incredibly informal. <laughs> we we have kind of off the wall conversation sometime, and it's great. And people drop in and drop out. So, um, yeah, the only other thing I would ask the three of you to do is if you if you know uh, folks who might be interested, feel free to send the Zoom link directly or the um, the PDF to have them reach out to me. Either way is fine. I like, I like the idea of experimenting to see what happens if this group gets like to the 20 person size. 
if we can still have good discussions. Um, that might be too big, but it's an experiment we can see. Um, so our group is open to outside UCF community, so pretty much anybody can participate? Quite literally, anybody can participate. Um, okay. There's a, I don't know, Shinor, what's going to happen if it gets huge, but it hasn't so far, right? It's only been a yeah. relatively small group. So no, I'm open to anybody in the world who wants to join us is, is good. Awesome. Um, yeah, it's been fun because, you know, sometimes we'll get community members dropping in or faculty and students from other institutions. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's fun to see that conversation go beyond UCF. So yeah, feel free to share. And thank you for facilitating these sessions. Really. Oh, it's my, yeah, it's my pleasure. I, I, so when I'm teaching, like I feel quite a bit of stress to get the story right and to like prepare enough material. And these conversations, I like that we can just get together and talk. And yeah. you know, if it lasts an hour, it's great. And if it lasts 20 minutes, it's totally fine. And yeah, it's, it's super fun. I'm glad to do it. And I really like thinking about the range of ethical issues at stake too. So yeah, that's fun. Uh, the other thing to mention to the three of you, if you've got suggestions for podcasts, so the other way to look at this is right. We've we've coupled each issue to a particular podcast, um, and I don't. I will admit I don't listen to enough podcasts. So if you've got a story and you can think of podcasts loosely, but um, or generously, but if you've heard a good podcast that has some ethical content and you want to think about that, we could develop an issue around it too. Um, so as a, for instance, the March 28th session on Xenobots, uh, one of the ethically speaking lecture series last semester was on Xenobots. We had a, a biologist, Michael Levin, come in and talk about his work. And then like a week and a half after his lecture to, to, to UCF, he made the national news again because his Xenobots had procreated. So two artificially created organisms, no, one artificially created organism had split and turned into two artificially created organisms, which has never happened in the history of the world before. Um, and so we don't really know what that means. Everybody was super excited or weirded out. And so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit on the 28th. Yeah. Um, other suggestions for topics? So I was gonna ask, uh, where are we keeping this recording so we can go back and listen to them if we were not able to attend certain sessions? Yep, that's the Center for Ethics has a YouTube channel. I will, um, after I sign in, I will send you, I'll drop the link in the chat here. Because the YouTube channel is public. I, not a lot of people pay any attention to it. Um, here is the link. And it has not only the Be Better Club sessions, but it has all of our previous events that the center's done. Um, as, as you all know, the center launched in 2019. So we did a, a launch session with, um, with Lisa Lee from University of Virginia, who I've known for a long time and she helped us get the thing going. We've hosted at least two um, external guest speakers before the Ethically uh, Speaking series launched. And, um, and then the Be Better Club. So there's quite a bit of content there that you can go back and review. Uh, and I've got to clean it up a little bit because just as a, for instance, the titles of the Be Better Club sessions aren't um, all uniform. And Haley, that might be something you can help me think about too. Because um, that channel right now is kind of a, a mess. <laughs> it's a dumping ground, but it's exciting. There's a lot of fun things going on, so. Yeah, and Shinor, let me know if, if that link doesn't work or you can't access it, but you should see 23 videos. Yeah, I was able to access it, so thank you. Great, yep, yep, no worries. Um, I was also thinking of concierge medicine. Have we Ooh. had that before? No, we haven't. Um, what were you thinking around concierge medicine? Um, so, you know, there has been this movement by primary care providers who now have adopted or opted to be concierge doctors and are not seeing, um, you know, patients um, that have either insurance or, um, you know, Medicaid, Medicare, and they strictly want like an a annual retainer. Um, and, you know, that's sort of... Um, 
I think eliminates majority of the population that would you know be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And so on one hand, we have shortage of providers. And then on the other hand, we have this movement where um, providers are actually abandoning their practices and, and going into concierge medicine. Yeah, that is super interesting. Because I could imagine two arguments, and I don't know the data here, so that would be something we could we could review. But it might be the case. My my instinct is that you're right, Shinor, that you know concierge medicine is sort of in. It, you could argue that it's unjust, right? Because it shuts the door to most of the population. On the other hand, I was thinking about my own experience. I've seen several dentists now who have basically two um, options. So they either take people with dental insurance or they have their like their own in-house plans where you pay basically a subscription fee and then that covers annual visits and emergencies. And the idea is those prices are a lot cheaper than the insurance prices. And they're, they're, they're betting that most people are just gonna come in for the annual cleaning and you know, or the six month cleaning or whatever and it's gonna be fine. And so they're gonna make all their money from their subscription service and not have to deal with the hassle of insurance. And so I've seen these two tier models in dentistry happening more and more regularly. Yeah. So I, I wonder if something similar is happening in medicine. It'd be really interesting. And if that's the case, then there might be an argument that the, the concierge service, if it becomes like a subscription service that's accessible, could keep prices down in a way that insurance hasn't. Yeah. Because that's the other, that's the other side of that argument, right? A lot of people argue, and I've seen this all over the place on the news and social media feeds, that the system is just broken the American healthcare system, right? That people are scared to go to the doctor because they don't know what they're going to pay. They might end up with nothing or thousands of dollars worth of bills or, um, yeah, it, it just goes on and on. So that would be a really interesting topic. Yeah, I mean, um, my PCP did that and um, she is charging $99 a month. So it would be $1,200 a year to, yes. to stay with her. Um, so I guess I, I see that that is cheaper than insurance, but on the other hand, it's basically just the, the PCP visit. So you would have to see them, I would say at least maybe once a month to, for it to even be worth it. But then oh, it leaves you without insurance for you know the actual care that you would need. So. Yeah, it would be, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard to evaluate without knowing the details there, but if your PCP is is charging $99 just for the, you know. Subscription. Like, yeah, just to go to see him or her. But then if you needed like an emergency visit or if you needed vaccinations or, or like medicine or something, all of that is additional. That does seem, yeah, yeah. The math is confusing to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, it would have to be for, um, I think for people who have chronic disease, that might work for them because they usually there once a week. Um, but people who only need to go see a doctor when they're sick, which is probably maybe two to three times a year, you know, that doesn't make sense. And then not to even mention all of the other stuff that you need to do. So I, I don't see it as a, um, a replacement for insurance, you would still need a health health plan. This is just um, privilege to see a certain doctor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I wonder if we can, yeah, let me look around or maybe you can help me too, but let's look around for a um, existing discussion about that, uh, preferably a podcast of some kind, and then we can build a, a discussion around that too. Okay. Not uh, that idea. I'm looking around. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's great. And as you're in Haley, if, if either of you think of things um, after the session today or, or whenever that might be interesting to discuss, discuss, let's get them on a list and then we can, um, I'll send out a poll to all of the mailing list and sort of um, see what idea floats to the top. And I think the, the plan, my plan anyway, would be that we can add, there's space to add one more session, sort of a final session this semester. And then the rest of the ideas we can push to the fall schedule. So we don't lose anything. It's just what, what we're going to prioritize. I have another one if we have time. 
Yeah, sure, Shelly, we've got time. Yeah. Um, I feel like I'm monopolizing the conversation, though. No, no, it's good. It's a small group. We can chime in when we want. Okay. Um, I don't know if we have had this discussion or maybe in the previous years when I wasn't uh, a participant, but have we talked about the role of United Nations? No, we have not. So you're thinking, is this, this is, this sounds related to the international relations yes. issue. Okay. Um, so you're thinking maybe like a, like ethical issues around shared governance? Yes. Yep. But, but also the effectiveness or ineffectiveness. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, I can imagine you could talk United Nations, EU, NATO, the European bloc. I mean, you could th think about any any historical instance of a group of governments trying to work together and think about the tensions between shared governance and, I don't know, effectively bureaucracy. Um, we could talk about the UK leaving the, the United Nations, I mean, EU. Is that yeah. something you would chat in mind? I think it's a very interesting topic because we are from different background and from different cultures. So it will be great to discuss different things like that, especially things that related to the United Nations and that uh, global organizations and to see the different opinions about some uh, current issues or concerns. I like it, I agree. Awesome, okay, that sounds good. I was, of other things in the contemporary news that always strike me um, tend to be environmental, even though it's broadly construed. Did you hear that there's a, um, a SpaceX rocket that's gonna crash into the moon in March? No. Yeah, no. so in, in 2012, I think it was 2012, one of SpaceX's first rockets, this massive beast of a rocket, was launched, and it lost. It was launched to to put a satellite into orbit. And I think, if I'm remembering right, it did that job, but then it lost navigational or directional control, and it's been in this like funky orbit now for several years with no recourse. And basically, um, we know to the day at this point that it's going to hit the far side of the moon at some absurd rate of uh, oh, speed. And, and that got me thinking, right, the Chinese last year, two, some year of the pandemic, crashed a rocket onto the moon that included uh, tardigrades, these little um, functionally indestructible microorganisms that can hibernate forever and basically be reconstituted. So now there are like little tardigrades sprinkled all over the moon. So there are organisms on the moon, which um, are alive. And that's never happened before that we know of. Um, and now there's this huge rocket that's going to crash and blow up all this like a bomb basically to blow up all this dust in the atmosphere. And the, I, I read an, an article recently where science, some scientist was like, oh, it's gonna be great. We can learn a lot about like what goes up into orbit and blah, blah, blah. Um, but it got me thinking about the idea of functionally space junk and our, our role in, in sort of um, astronomical environments. Like to what extent do we have any obligations around space junk? Wow, I'm I gonna add that to the list. That. Yeah, it's there's so many weird things going on <laughs> in the world. It's hard to keep them all straight. Yeah. So along the, the same lines, I had um, heard that um, the super rich are going to be, you know, I mean, I guess everybody is worried that our planet is um, probably not going to be around too much longer. And that the super rich are, um, are making preparations to move to space. Um, I, I don't know exactly where. And leave the rest of us here on Earth. And you know, it's it's like what those really scary movies from like decades ago. And you're like, oh my god, I can't believe that this could actually be happening. So um yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. They're either going to move to space or New Zealand. Uh, the other story that is constantly on the news is that multimillionaires are buying these functionally bunkers in New Zealand, which is supposed to be a supposedly like a climate um, climate mediated zone, right? Sort of a space safe space on the planet, not very populated, beautiful, all that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the, yeah. That, I don't know what to call that in terms of a topic, but that would be really fun to talk through too. Yeah. And I, I I don't know if New Zealand is a far enough escape myself. So <laughs> yeah, well, th th there's even if we don't push to space, the idea that a lot of people are trying to think about um, moving, like what what privilege does to avoiding climate change, right? Because we talk a lot about rising sea levels, and the people that are going to be most effective affected are the the worse off, right? It's one of these deep injustice problems. Um, there's this really interesting thing going on in Duluth, Minnesota right now, where property property prices are skyrocketing because, uh, again, apparently, that's supposed to be one of the least affected places in North America, um, given what we know about a changing climate into the future. And so people are like climate refugees, quote unquote, are uh, rich people basically are buying property in Duluth with the idea that they're going to move there to get away from like the fires out west and the flooding in Miami and whatever else is happening. Um, so yeah, we could talk about uh, uh, sort of justice issues around climate mitigation too. Yeah. But space, I hadn't heard that one, Shinor. That is interesting. Yeah. We're gonna escape to space. That is definitely the stuff of science fiction stories that I remember watching. <laughs> or I know. I know. And, and the sad part is, I mean, every shuttle launch that happens, how much does that impact our environment? And, and so, I mean, it's just kind of an oxymoron to, to kind of think that they are doing that in the hopes that they would go and make space their new home. Um, so, but it is what it is. Yep. Yep. It's interesting. And then to compare to compare what's happening in, in space on that end of things with like the really scientifically incredible uh, final positioning of this big new uh, web space telescope. Uh, mm -hmm. We're doing a lot of really amazing scientific things in space and then sending rich people up there too. <laughs> it's yeah. very interesting, the disparity, yeah. Well, thank you, friends. This is I'm really grateful to the three of you for being here, and we will do this again in two weeks. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Stay safe, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Shano. You too. We'll see you next time. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.